got uh, a good panel tonight on Emma's health, how mobile can make us healthier. They're going to answer every one of our questions about how mobile diagnostics are going to help us, which is pretty awesome. I saw today that uh, a company is working on a way of detecting skin cancer with an iPhone camera. And uh, I think we're on the verge of some pretty amazing things with mobile health. And this panel has a ton of experience on that. I'm looking forward to it. See our agenda tonight. We uh, had some networking time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our upcoming events and announcements. We'll have our panel. And uh, that's the last thing there. I can read it. Uh, questions and discussion. Yeah, so that'll be part of the panel. Oh, yeah. If I couldn't read the last one, I sure can't read that one. <laughs> so what are we about? We're about mobiles. Uh, we meet the fourth Monday of every month, well almost every month, usually excluding November and December given how crazy those months are. Um, we're uh, vaguely affiliated with the Mobile Monday Group, <coughs> who uh, is a national organization focused on uh, meetings on mobile topics every Monday, and that's how we ended up having this on fourth Monday of every month. Uh, agendas and information is always available to you at mobileportland.com. You're also welcome to sign up. There's both a Google group and a mailing list if you'd like to be notified of what's coming up. It's a pretty low, low bandwidth kind of thing. There are a lot of stuff going on, but uh, companies and other people involved usually post information and other stuff there. It's, it's wonderful to be involved with this group uh, in the Google group. Out of curiosity, how many people have never been to Mobile Portland before? About half the room, which is pretty typical, actually. A few uh, upcoming events here, you can kind of take a look through. This is also available on the mobileportland.com website. Um, Jason does an excellent job of keeping this up to date. In particular, OSCOM's coming up, and uh, of course you can't miss our next Mobile Portland meeting. So, And then our next few Mobile Portland meetings, we got the uh, OSCOM tie-in next month. The agenda isn't set yet, but uh, some great people coming out for that. We should have some really interesting conversations about mobile and mobile web. Uh, in August, we're looking at mobile analytics. Um, in September, talking about nonprofits, and uh, in October, back to mobile advertising. So some good things coming up through the summer. I can't believe we're already talking about October meetings. Like this year has just disappeared. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, Azad. Did I say that right? Um, they are our, our uh, special featured uh, uh, um, sponsors for this evening, along with Urban Airship. Um, and uh, Lynn Naughton, I wanted to invite you to talk for a few minutes about Azad. So I'm just going to be very brief, and those of you who aren't familiar with Azad introduce you to us. Uh, we are a technology consulting company. We've been in Portland about 20 years now. Um, we're really excited about Mobile Portland and the mobile community. Our focus is primarily in product development, with our clients being Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. So we have a great core team of developers, um, but we're really looking to grow our staff in the mobile space. And that includes everything from hardware design, systems development, applications, user experience. The um, so one thing I've heard this evening talking to people is people said, oh, you know, I'd love to work on Android or iOS, but I don't have that experience. We actually are looking for talented developers
Thanks. <laughs> so while we're on the topic of hiring developers, um, our last segment here before I introduce our moderator and our panel, uh, we open it up for people in the audience if you have a job opening or an announcement or a product or something that you're working on that you'd like to mention to the group here tonight, you're welcome to stand up and say something. Some interesting data points 
Um, year over year growth rate in the mobile health space is about 17 percent uh, from 2010 to now. Expected to grow to about 2.1 billion by the end of this year, and a compound annual growth rate of 22 percent from 2012 to 2014. So those of you who are here to think about mobile health apps, it certainly is a growing space. Um, how are mobile health apps being used in, uh, in healthcare education awareness is one category. Remote data collection, remote monitoring, disease and epidemic outbreak tracking, diagnostic and treatment support, and a whole myriad of other uh, categories that you'll see touched on in mobile health and just more and more every day. Some sample apps that you see out there, blood pressure monitoring, obviously, uh, cardiac monitoring, uh, diagnostic image viewing, the category I just came from in my last company, Diabetes management, electronic health records, no surprise there. Prescription medication information, medical transcription, and general medical information. Bottom line is it's a growing, thriving, dynamic space with lots of opportunities. I think there's a lot of um, equity money uh, and venture, venture type money flowing into the space. Uh, mobile is big to begin with. Uh, mobile health is obviously very big. So you're going to hear from our team panelists tonight uh, they're each going to touch on a number of interesting issues impacted in the mobile health arena. And uh, the idea is uh, each panelist will spend about five minutes sharing some insights, and then we're going to open the room to Q&A because this is really your meeting. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce the panel. If you guys want to uh, wander up here, you guys and gal, excuse me. Um, Michael Coffin, who you'll meet in a minute, is president of InfoMed Publishing, a medical publisher for pre-hospital health care providers. Uh, who include uh, paramedics, EMTs, critical care nurses, and acute care nurses. Um, and uh, originally known for their award-winning pocket field guides, uh, Michael's company has transform transformed these guides into apps that are uh, medical category leaders in iTunes, the Android Marketplace, Amazon apps, Barnes & Noble's Note. Is that still around? And uh, uh, Cisco's new platform and marketplace. Cisco's getting into the game. So uh, Michael's going to touch on digital publishing opportunities and risks, uh, social implications with uh, an interesting example, I'm intrigued, uh, privacy implications as the pace of adoption accelerates, and the role of social media in product development and quality control. Don't mind me. Uh, Shital Dumi will be uh, talking uh, about um, how mobile health solutions can help change patient behavior for better, better clinical outcomes. She'll share some guidelines on designing mobile health applications targeting behavior change. How is she qualified to do that? Well, let me share some information about that. Uh, Chantel is a user experience consultant who recently founded the startup AudioMini, which I believe is not healthcare related. Uh, in the last five years, though, she has worked extensively with patients and physicians to design products that can help improve uh, patients' health conditions. These products range from patient self-management tools to physician applications for monitoring patient health conditions. Her clients include lots of big companies. They've been very successful in that category. Jeff Brandt, our third esteemed panelist, is the founder of Communication Software here in Portland. He has a BS in computer science, currently in the Biomedical Information Informatics Master's Program at OHSU. Say that 10 times, Jeff. Uh, Jeff entered the mobile health field in, uh, with the first secure personal health record for the Android and iPhone markets currently co-authoring a book on mobile health for HIMSS. So welcome all the panelists. Oh, and, and Jeff's going to talk about the regulatory issues uh, facing mobile health uh, developers and having just finished a company that the FDA killed, that you'll, uh, I'll be interested to hear what, uh, what he has to say about that, and ethical issues impacting mobile health development. So uh, welcome all. Michael, I'm going to have you kick it off. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for having me. This is my first time at Mobile Portland. Can you, can you hear me out there? Good? How about that? Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Well, for the last 25 years, we've been known as the Little Pocket Guide Company. We have uh, manufactured, we've published these guides that are used by first responders, paramedics, EMTs, critical care nurses, acute care health providers. And with the advent of the iPhone, it was just too tempting for us not to put this on an iPhone. So that was what we did in uh, 2007, as soon as Apple would let us. And today we're, we're on most of the smart devices and now the tablets that are coming out. 
we succeeded in doing this as a digital publisher, and we didn't really have a background in digital publishing at all. We were more of a traditional publisher. But we succeeded by repurposing the content into calculators and checklists that would help people make rapid decisions. Um, our motto has always been critical information at your fingertips, and so it really made a lot of sense for us to follow that as we went digital. Today I'm going to quickly touch on five areas that we have impacted or have been impacted by as we become a digital publisher. Um, the opportunities and risks <laughs> of seeing, the social implications of what we're dealing with, uh, privacy, and then how we've been fortunate to discover how to use social media in a really good way. Um, in terms of opportunities, live data feeds from incident scenes are where we think we're going to go next. Because right now our apps are native. They're meant to give you information in any environment, anywhere. And of course now with bandwidth starting to uh, become more available, um, in network bandwidth as well as Wi-Fi, we're going to be able to, uh, to expand on that. Remediation of systemic misinformation in healthcare systems is another big opportunity for us as well. Um, Later, I, if you stop by, I will frighten you with how much misinformation there is in the healthcare system today. And having checklists, obviously, will improve on that. Um, improper usage is a big risk. And uh, I'll give you that, that interesting example. Last July, we had a paramedic in Georgia who had a smart device on him. And he took mobile video of a victim at a crash scene and had it posted on YouTube within minutes. It went viral around the world before his agency ever knew what happened. And it was a shocking example for us for just how out of control this, this piece could get. Our clients look to us to build apps that are, you know, are designed in such a way to reduce these kinds of risks. But it's you know, really impossible to, to figure out what people are going to do with devices that they own, the software that they own and control. It's very different. So we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, the social implications are obviously improved public safety, and, and that, that's a great thing. Uh, improving the health care that you're able to receive by simply reducing the number of mistakes that will naturally occur in any human-based system. So we see that uh, you know, as something that's very important. Transparency, public communication, and just overall responsiveness are all areas that are going to touch our lives. Privacy is a whopper. We're now moving to the cloud, and many of our government clients state federal clients do not want to touch the cloud right now because they're very concerned about the data that's going to be collected there and how it's going to be used. In social media, um, we have been able to take advantage of communities that are based around the particular titles that we have produced. And they have been wonderfully helpful to us in terms of research, quality control. I mean, now we wouldn't do this, but it seems, it seems like whenever we put a product out, we only have to wait 15 minutes to find out everything that's wrong with it, and then we can fix it, push out an update, and, and we're good for another six months. That's how it feels some days, but uh, we do take advantage of the fact that social media is so effective, and especially in vetting new product ideas. Um, I come from a time when you used to protect your ideas with NDA. Now I don't. I go out on Facebook and I say, hey, here's what we're thinking about, what do you think? And 15 and 20 minutes later, maybe an hour later, we have enough research to be able to, enough feedback to actually start to make some decisions about what we want to do with the product. So it's, it's just wonderful. Um, in terms of our outlook, in the past 24 months, we went from being a traditional publisher to a company that, as of today, has now sold as many units in digital as it has in print year to date. And by next year, digital will overtake our publishing business by, by a multiple. Don't know what that multiple is just yet, but it's definitely. I uh, look forward to uh, answering questions, and uh, like half the other people in this room, I'm also hiring, so if you're interested in public health and public safety and health apps, just let me know. Great, thanks, Michael. You can pass the uh, microphone to Tal, please. Take it away. Uh, yeah, so, um, um, you know, I, uh, I was thinking what to talk about because mobile health and user experience, there's a lot happening. So I thought that maybe I should just start off giving an example of a healthcare user, and I would say all of us are healthcare users, but the example of someone I, you know, I share an incident uh, that happened yesterday. So I'd taken my daughter for, uh, you know, a birthday party, and I was meeting all her friends and her, their mothers, and, you know, we were talking, and I realized, like, one of the, her friend's mothers was particularly, like, she'd really taken care of herself. She was a mother of two. She was around 35 years old. 
and you know everyone was munching pizza, but she was having an apple and a cereal bar. So I uh, I I enjoy or I I'm interested to find out how different people actually take care of their you know health, and you know I've done a lot of studies on that. So I just walked up to her and I asked her, you know. You know, I'm really, you know, you seem like you really take care of your health and, you know, can you tell me about, you know, what's your regime and what do you do? And she had like a whole elaborate regime and she told me like, you know, last week and she couldn't do her exercise because she had to take the kids to the beach, but instead she did the X, Y, Z. And I was very impressed by the thoroughness that she had. So, you know, again, as a user experience consultant, you want to probe further and find out, you know, what's really motivating her. So. So I asked her, you know, you know, what is that motivation factor? And she said, you know, my grandmother, she had osteoporosis, and uh, she she was hunched for a very, you know, for a long period of her life, she had a hunched back, and I do not want to have osteoporosis, and I'm doing everything that I can so that, you know, I'm having, I go through this whole regime, I have my 900 grams of calcium every day, I make sure my diet is okay, and. And when I actually thought about, you know, I related that to my talk today, I, I realized like her name is Kristen. So Kristen was an ideal healthcare consumer. And when we are designing products and applications, we try to look for, you know, how can our products make people first aware of their health condition? So Kristen there knows what her health condition is. Kristen is engaged in her health, so she's actually taking actions to really, you know, keep her health in good shape, like, you know, so she, she's really an engaged user. And the third thing that you really want to do when you're designing products is you want be, you want your healthcare user to be empowered. So really, like, not only are they now doing reactive things, but they are even getting into preventive care. So someone like Kristen is actually trying to do preventive care. She She's making her own decisions. She can change her care plan, you know. Today she couldn't exercise in a certain way, so she was doing something else. So Kristen was a very good example of someone who's aware engaged and empowered and there's a lot of research that shows like to really have successful mobile health solutions if you can get people to be more empowered to a stage that they really understand their health and can go to a healthcare you know provider and discuss you know this medication does not work for me or you know this kind of regimen does not work for me so those kind of if, if patients reach that level we can really design solutions that will work for them because generally what happens if if there is, you know, people cannot adhere to a med uh, medication uh, plan or a care plan, it's really because it's not fitting their lifestyle. So what we're really trying to do when we design mobile health solution is trying to take people from the aware to the really empowered stage. And uh, mobile as such is a very, uh, you know, so far we didn't have mobile devices, but mobile really is a very personal device which really allow, and, and a very engaging device. I mean, mobile use is even surpassing desktop use today. So. Mobile really gives us that opportunity to get the patients or a healthcare user really engaged. And uh, while there is a lot of you know good good information out there, and people who are designing systems like this for behavior change should really look at what uh, Professor B J Fogg is doing at the Stanford University. And there's some you know he talks a lot about motivation and triggers and actions. But if I was to just summarize it, I would say like you know when you're designing a solution. Try and get people aware of their health and you'll be surprised like so many people do not know that they need help. Like in South Africa, 25% of the people have AIDS but only 3% of people know that they have AIDS. Or if you go, go into obesity, 70% of the people are obese who are obese actually think they're just overweight. So, so people are not even aware of their health condition so they really can't do the, take the next step of you know doing some actions to improve their health. So, uh, how can we design systems that really help people collect data about their health is the first thing that we need to be careful about, we need to design for. The second thing is, how can we interpret those different data points and make sense to, make sense, like, so if this was my diet plan, and this was my medication, and, and things change, how did that really impact my health? So if we can start designing solutions that can help people interpret what is happening with their health, that would be huge. And the third would be like when people really reach that engaged state where now they know that, oh, that medication did not work, really help them take actions that can, quick actions. So, you know, that medication doesn't work and I send a message to my physician and, you know, make sure like next time this is taken care of. So how can we really take people from that aware to that empowered stage when we're designing solutions. So, uh, you know, that's there in the nutshell and I think if we, you know, follow that kind of a process, we would probably have more Christians uh, as healthcare users and, you know, that would really help us design better solutions. So, thank you. Thanks, you, Tom. Jeff? Uh, great points there. And 
it's interesting about, I've been in uh, mobile health for about the time the uh, iPhone came out, and I'm a medical informatics student now at OHSU. Well, once, the last class that I had was about ethics. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about that and how that folds into a uh, government agency and legal that actually watches to make sure we're ethical in what we do. Um, some of the points that have been made earlier is one of the most important things to help in the United States, when I say that because not always everywhere, is autonomy. Uh, people are very, in the United States, want to make sure everything as possible is private. It's one of our biggest responsibilities, and part of the ethics that I see that we need to be and use inside uh, mobile health is be ethical. Protect people's rights, protect their, uh, their records, and protect providers. Providers uh, take on a huge load of responsibility and a lot of the tools that are out there that they use every day, if they fail, it falls on the provider because he has the insurance, basically, and because of the democratic oath. Well, I think it's really valuable to us as health producers of apps and uh, systems to, under, to read that democratic oath and understand the real, what's going on, why we're taking it so seriously. I used to write software for uh, switching uh, systems for Siemens and uh, class five, things like you to dial tone. Uh, my first boss right out of college told me, you know what, if you write a bad patch and you bring down the switch, I guarantee you someone will die. It stuck with me, it really stuck with me. I think we should think the same way uh, about healthcare. You know, people are dependent on it. Now, on the flip side of that, which is not so fun, is the legal. So we have multiple government agencies that uh, oversee what we do in healthcare. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, they're getting to be more involved. The FDA uh, in February made a um, final uh, ruling on what they call it MDDS. And <laughs> they're laughing. And <laughs> my system went from a, a nice uh, remote PHR to a class one medical device in a, in a handshake, basically. And uh, anything that connects to, mobile, uh, to Microsoft Health Vault now is a medical device class one and has to be put through FDA. That means at a minimum $25,000 out of our pocket, your pocket, my pocket. That could change, I doubt it. I, the final doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But uh, then there's another uh, <coughs> law, HIPAA, 90, it was 93 when it came out. Um, it's basically the Health in, um, Insurance Portability Act. But it's basically what protects privacy. You know when you go into Safeway to get a, um, oh, you get a script and you got to stand behind a line? Well, that's part of HIPAA. A lot of it's ridiculous, and people will tell you about it. But um, there's another law that came out uh, when the ARRA came out called a high-tech, high-tech, high yes. It put the teeth in uh, HIPAA. So one thing I highly, highly suggest is going into business with somebody building your own app, partnering, go out to the FDA.gov and see if they are a medical device. I'm not saying that's not a, a good thing, it could actually be a very good thing that they are. It kind of calls the herd on everybody else getting into the, uh, into the space. But it also means that you're going to have to go through a lot of pre-set up to make sure that you're FDA. Okay, so familiarize yourself, whoever wants to go into this space, of what the laws are. You know, value is knowing what you have, what you're up against. And again, it's not a bad thing. I think it's actually a good thing. There's a lot of apps out there that say they're healthcare. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to use them or depend on them. But you know, a lot of people do depend on them. They think uh, it comes off the app store, it must be good. Well, well, we know how that is. So hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with a question actually for Michael, uh, given one of your comments about. Uh, you, you put out a, um, an information product, that is, it, it, it informs paramedics and EMTs and that category of folks uh, uh, about what dosage to do in an IV or what drug to give in a particular situation. You put that out and then you get information back. So in effect, you're crowdsourcing your information content. So how do you reconcile that notion of crowdsourcing with your own quality control systems and with notions of privacy? Well, we begin with a process where we make sure that the information that we're publishing is technically correct, and we use subject matter experts for that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we put it out into the public, and invariably, within minutes, someone will argue with us. 
and then we'll take the arguments and we'll test the arguments with our SMEs to make sure that our humans haven't made a mistake. And sometimes our users are right, and we are quick to acknowledge that and make use of that information. Um, so it's, uh, it's very organic is the answer to that question. We're very mindful of it. Uh, we're obviously insured as a publisher would be insured for liability. Um, and we're quick to act. We never wait. Uh, because you never want to have happen you know, the kind of thing that recently happened in Seattle, uh, where, where there was an incorrect dosage that was given to me. And it was it's human error. Uh, it was one of those things where a checklist, a metric, would have probably prevented it. Um, and there's reliance on that information. And as I, you know, Jeff was mentioning, uh, if you buy that app, you download it, you tend to trust it because you've invested in it. And so we are, are very careful to make sure that that information is, is correct. And, and it's a constant process of making sure. Great, thanks. Are you scared yet? Everybody leaving? No more mobile apps in healthcare. We're, we're done. <coughs> you got the regulatory folks coming down on you on one hand. You got the legal folks coming down on the other. You got customers who want to rely on you. Uh, so, with all that, you must have questions. Not a beer consumed yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, and I think it goes to any of you about. So not from the legal aspect or anything, but uh, we've done a lot of studies with physicians and uh, you know, so so what, when we are coming up, like a lot of clients that I work for are like medical device companies, so the product is coming from the device and then I go to the physicians to you know, take their feedback and the first thing they say is, I don't want more data. They are just so overwhelmed with different systems, different data. Now you know you have a person with chronic conditions who's got like heart disease, who's got diabetes, and they're trying to reconcile all that information. And what it really comes down, it's what. And when you really talk to them, it's not like they don't want data, but they want more meaningful data. They want systems that can really talk to each other and interpret each other, so that they have one dashboard and they're not looking through like ten different dashboards of ten different medical devices. So. The, the, the system that we have designed really for physicians is how can we take this data like so if one medical device, the, uh, you know, the medical device company that uh, was our client, so they have like heart products and diabetes, so what we try to do is try to make dashboards, so instead of uh, giving them like different data from different reports, but how, what, how can we create smarter dashboards for them so that the data is more meaningful and they can make better decisions, quicker decisions, especially for chronically ill patients they need. So they need that data, but they don't need another report. They just need it to be more meaningful. So that's one aspect of it. You know, the, it's interesting because she said she works for big um, producers of metal device, metal devices. Uh, for people like are in our room that may not be doing that, uh, one of the things that the FDA can bring is credibility to you really quick. So for, uh, you know, if, it, if it's FDA approved, it actually allows the hospital, the caregiver, the organization to say, oh, we got the seal approval at Better Homes and Garden, you know, kind of thing. And uh, that, that helps, I believe, a lot. But the, there is a lot of pushback from the, from the doc side because they, they don't understand it yet. So it's going to take time. So, excuse me, Mike, one, one other comment from a business model perspective regarding the FDA. The FDA is a hurdle when it's in front of you, and it's a barrier when it's behind you. So from a business perspective, when you get your product cleared by the FDA, uh, you do have that stamp of approval. And, um, and so it's relied on more in the healthcare community, but more importantly, others that want to get in the same category or space that you're in also have to go through that process. And until they do, it's a barrier to entry. Getting into that, yes. Okay. I'm just going to add one more thing in answer to the question about uh, feedback from docs. Our software is often used pre-hospital emergency situations. And the one bit of feedback we get from care providers most often is they want to know when the patient is received into an acute environment that a certain triage protocol has taken place. Steps missed in that protocol require them to go backward rather than forward. And so the one thing that, that we have been hearing consistently is they like the checklists because they know 
if the checklist has been followed, they know where they can start their work in care, rather than having to stop and figure out where to start. That helps. Doctors are getting pressed six ways from Sunday. They're being forced to adopt electronic medical records and other technologies to practice in healthcare um, with, with, with the goal of efficiency. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I know I was at my doctor's office recently and he's got an electronic health record system on laptops. And um, they're replacing the entire system because the one they bought four or five years ago just doesn't really work. So welcome to the world of healthcare technology. Yes, sir. So there's a lot of um, applications out there you know, things that catch your life and engage you. There's a lot of lifestyle stuff, like how are you getting how are you things like that. Where does that cross over into the medical? Basically, it's when you provide something that's used for a Can you restate the question as well? Yes. Um, when does a health app that helps you, like calorie counting or walking or something like that, cross to a medical device. And basically, I have it down here, but it's basically when you provide, it's part of making a decision, a diagnosis. A tongue depressor is a class one medical device, if you can believe that. But if you buy a tongue depressor that does not say that it's, you know, from Johnson Johnson, it doesn't say it's for medical, and a doctor chooses to use that, it's not a medical device. So it, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with labeling. So that's one thing to remember in, in this, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, labeling what you write that you're actually doing. Because if you don't step past that line, then people can actually use it, know how it uses it, but not have to get FDA. So it's about whether a device is providing clinical or therapeutic value and, and being marketed as such. So what Jeff mentioned is labeling is what the FDA actually is responsible for. So, um, you, there, there was a product uh, when I was doing the fundraising round here, a product that uh, somebody had that uh, it, it blinked a red light on the ceiling. And, and the, the idea was it would help you go to sleep if you had insomnia. And they had to be very careful how they marketed it to say, you know, it's relaxing or something. And, and they couldn't go across the line and say it will help you sleep. Uh, because then they would move into the world where it required FDA approval. The FDA then, when you go through that process, uh, what they clear is a label. That is, what they give you permission to do is market and sell a medical device. And uh, most of the stuff that we talk about in this room would be class one, maybe class two, um, which is the easiest hurdle to get through. You don't want to be a class three. And um, you go through the process, and some processes are more, more onerous than others. But at the end of the day, what they do is they give you the green light to market your product under a specific label. And that label then says exactly what you are approved to say about your device, your product. This is a device, you have to go through FDA, uh, your software, your, your app, uh, when you take it to market and put it in the app store or whatever. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, dovetailing out of that question, you see there being Michael, did you have something? Yeah, I was going to mention that, I mean, there, there are glimmers of hope. 
that things are going to move faster in Washington. Uh, one of those, those uh, points of light is Anish Chopra, our chief technology officer. Um, we're, we're on a committee that's advising them on spectrum for public safety. We, of course, want it so that we can build faster apps, but not only that, but apps that have priority to that spectrum so that we can send large files when we need to. The challenge has been that the feedback that we're giving to him is consistent amongst all the panelists, and that is that technology is moving faster than their ability to make decisions. So I don't think that the FDA is going to be able to do this in any way. And all we can hope to do is to see large blocks of money get moved into areas for private development of solutions that the government is more likely to adopt because they invested in it. That, I think, is, is the best outcome we can hope for. Yeah, I, I tend to be quite cynical when it comes to Washington, particularly um, in, in the current administration, and this isn't a political statement, it's a, it's a factual statement. In the current administration, um, there is a belief in a very heavy-handed regulatory part, not a light-handed regulatory part. So the notion of easing a process is an anathema to this administration. So I wouldn't hold my breath that the process will become easier um, and, you, you know, I think at the end of the day, as you design your apps, you have to make a decision about whether uh, you need to cross the regulatory line and, and seek FDA approval or whether you can gain enough market share by simply marketing it in a, in a way that doesn't run afoul of FDA pro prescriptions. Um, and that's, you know, that's a business decision and an economic decision. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm going to beat this uh, at the end of a little bit more. Um, in terms of, we talked about It deserves apps. to be beat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a lot about apps. Uh, well, some of the apps out there also have a, a, an online analog, right? So, you know, you go on the PD on the internet, you can see some of the same information. A lot of fitness apps, health apps, that kind of thing. What's the line? In other words, if I use my iPad, is, is the FDA used for this? Like, what if I use my notebook? I'm sort of having an idea of the from a form factor perspective. Where does the FDA step in? We have, and where does it step out? Because right now there's a lot of stuff online, which is more traditional if you will, channel, but I don't know very much about the fact. So let me just repeat the question, then I'll throw it to the panel. The question is, where is the line for both mobile and then analog online apps? Uh, when, do you, when, when do you really have to go to the FDA and get clearance, and when, when do you not? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? I don't think the form factor matters in that. It's really what you're actually doing that, that makes the difference. Uh, one of the things that they're really interested in is, and it's because of history, you know, they started building medical devices that then they had embedded software. The FDA has now stretched that to covering software. They've opened up a huge can of worms and uh, for them and, you know, and expanding their power. But I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just how they're going to deal with is what's going to be interesting. The real interesting thing about the, what's going on with Microsoft and the pieces that hook to them, most of the people that I know out there that connect to it are saying, I'm not paying any attention to it, I'm going to wait and see where, what, where it ends. That could be good, maybe. So an example uh, of, of the migration to the mobile world, um, my last company was in uh, imaging, uh, MRI imaging. And what was interesting is, uh, this didn't affect my company, but I was aware of it, is, um, you know, for decades there has been imaging, whether it's CAT scans or X-rays or MRI or whatever, PET scans, whatever. And doctors look at those images first on film and then on computers, and then it moved to the iPad when it first came out, where doctors wanted to look at imaging data on the iPad. And the vendors that developed the apps that would allow the image to show up on the iPad had to go through FDA clearance. Uh, and the reason is a physician was going to look at those images on the iPad and make diagnostic treatment decisions based on what they saw. So it's it's messy. Do we have any non-FDA questions?
talk with uh, the Dublin dietitians. The question that I have is still, and there's about seven, eight, eight different uh, separate pages filled with very detailed stuff teaching people about nutrition. Does this cross the line between being a lifestyle app to being an FDA approved So the question is, based on all the design features he described, uh, does his app cross the line in the nutrition world from being a dietary app to being a therapeutic app? Uh, I don't think we can answer that. Uh, it's, it's labeling. I think it's really labeling. Yeah, he's doing, but it's marketing thing, first and labeling second. Go ahead. But I mean, from the point of view of the FDA, how do you label what you're doing? Because it's all about the diagnosis. But, but let me tell you one thing, I am not a lawyer, and I'm not a consultant, I'm just telling you, and, and there is a lot of people that do this uh, out there, and that's what I would suggest is go to somebody, but if you take the time and just read what's on the, uh, about medical devices, it's, most of the data is out there, uh, you, can, you can see a lot of it yourself, and, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear. The bottom line is what you say about the product. That, that determines whether you cross the line, how you work. Not FDA. Okay, uh, so I have a question actually, uh, primarily for Chantal, but actually for the rest of the panel as well. Uh, so one of the one of the things that you had in your presentation, she has a presentation on SlideShare that's really good as well. Uh, what will you ask for help? So one of the things that was in your presentation was about mobile applications or devices being behavior change. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that encouragement of behavior change might actually be related to a tackling um, that the big problem in our healthcare system, which is around preventative health. Yeah, so, um, so behavior change is a big part of it. And I think um, a lot of it is, has to do even with the mindset. Like especially when you come to chronic conditions, there is, we still have the school of thought that it's not my responsibility, it's the physician's responsibility to fix my problem. And when we're talking about behavior change, one of the key components is really trying to shift that responsibility from the physician to the patient so that it's more like participatory. And, uh, and uh, some of the, some of the, um, uh, some of the work that Professor B.J. Falk has done in this area is really about trying to see how we can have, he calls them hot triggers, so it could be like an SMS, it could be like an email, it could be like a, you know, what is that hot trigger that you can put in the path of a motivated person so that that person takes an action and, you know, experiences uh, or makes a change in their behavior. So. So that is, that is one thing that is really being uh, tried out. Only yesterday, actually, I uh, signed up for uh, uh, an online journal, and uh, it was, it's called O Life. And what they do is like someone who, it's difficult to write a journal, right? So they've come up with a simple app, which every night it sends me a, a reminder, an email, to tell me, okay, what did you do in the day? And I don't, so I don't have to go and log into something else. This is a push, which is really coming into my email. I write what I did and I do a send. So people are experimenting with what are those hot triggers. Like the only success that has been there is like more in terms of SMS reminders for, uh, you know, medication adherence or text for babies being like pretty successful where, uh, again, there are, they've used like SMS messages to really make mothers more aware of, you know, uh, what tests they need to do, but but the success has been really in this area of how can you put those hot triggers in the path of a motivated user or a patient to really bring about behavior change. And there's a reason why that's important. Um, you know, we spend 2.5 plus trillion dollars a year on healthcare in this country. A lot of that um, is a result of patient non-compliance. For example, a big area is non-compliance with prescriptions, right? People don't take their, their meds when they're supposed to. So they get re-hospitalized and they end up with, with worse problems. And so systems as Chital described, which can help people do a better job of taking their medications, actually helps the patient and it, and it 
helps the healthcare system. Question in the back. Yeah, um, in terms of the same usability issues, there's lots of ways of encouraging people to do things. When does it cross the line between A, annoying, or B, <laughs> seeming trivial? Yeah. And, and be, so how do you get to that sweet spot of something that somebody wants to engage in and still be uh, something that's useful for their health? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the question is like in terms of, you know, when does it become annoying? And that's really where we do, um, so I was doing a study for a new product, completely new product for heart patients for self-management. And I went and you know looked at people on the East Coast, Midwest, uh, on the West Coast to really see how they manage their heart conditions. And we're talking about 75 plus people who have an implanted device, you know, who've had a heart attack, who've been hospitalized, and we're trying to come up with a system where, uh, you know, uh, they get more information about their heart condition and uh, they can take certain actions. So this was a little uh, more intrusive, so we wanted to see where it will stick. And a lot of people were like, you know, it's not for me, it's, this is not for me. And that is where you really need to go and study your population to see what is their current lifestyle and also who is going to be that early adopter. Because, because when we looked at that patient population, a lot of people who, who were at a later stage of heart failure felt like, you know, they might use it, it's intrusive, but if it can make their day better, if, you, if it can make them get up and really go out to the grocery store and come back, they will use that device. So, one is you really need to study, like, who is going to benefit it most, who is going to be that early adopter, and then what is that value they're going to get. But that's where you really need to do a lot of contextual inquiries, but you're right, a lot of people would just, like, a lot of devices, people don't use and put it in their cupboards and don't even look at them. So. There, are there any studies on what's, what, what really is a reward? I mean, I can see reward-based uh, encouragements being used well. Uh, a reward-based, but for chronic conditions, so the people I really study for chronic conditions, the reward is I'm not hospitalized, <laughs> and uh, I'm, you know, so I'm feeling good today, and I, uh, I could get up and go to the grocery store, so those are their rewards. So if whatever they're doing gets them to do that, they in fact stop taking medication for the next two days because they feel, oh, now I'm okay, and that's the problem again. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for uh, Michael. In the population, the safety community, do you have any visibility into whether first responders are using their own devices? Or uh, I presume that, the, that their agencies are buying apps for them, but do you know whether they're using their own iPads or iPhones? And, and like there's an Android, iPhone, whatever. How does that break, how that breaks down? Uh, yes, uh, we do. The question was, uh, in the public safety sphere, uh, are the devices being used by first responders, devices that are provided by their agencies, or are they owned by the user? Um, and we do have a very, uh, we have very deep optics into that. And the sad fact is, is these are products that are owned by the user. The software that is purchased is by the user. I won't name the county, but we were contacted this week and asked to develop an app for a major U.S. city's fire response unit, and they wanted us to develop the app and then sell it to their employees. So it's a sign of the times, um, I think. But uh, the majority of our users own not only our device, but the software itself. It's a very, very challenging thing. This really crosses into security and um, part of the violations of HIPAA that can get you in a lot of trouble. Hospitals are having a lot of issues right now because the docs are the ones who can afford the iPads. They can afford the iPhones. They're the ones that have not all the nurses. They don't have them as money. But being able to take care of that management of those systems is laid right on the HIT, on the health information uh, system at the hospital or in these type of organizations. So there's there's ways to get to that point, um, but it is a big problem and the liability still lays on the well, at this thing you're alive with either the fire department or or the county or both. Other questions? From this side. Um, I have just two on the sheet. So one you were talking about how um, you like to be responsive and updating your Very good questions. Um, 
in terms of the update cycle itself, we use social media to make announcements. We also use our web page, but frankly, social media is more effective. Um, we tweet, we put out posts on the Facebook product pages, letting people know there is an update. We watch the rate of update, and, and it's very, very high. Uh, we typically don't see first responders sitting there with an update that is more than a couple of weeks old. So there, there, there's a mentality of conscientiousness about having the most up-to-date information. They yell at us if they think we have an app out that isn't all the way up to date. And every five years, the American Heart Association puts out new protocols, and we have to basically re-engineer all of our content on that five-year cycle because of that. Um, in terms of how the Apple App Store has been for updates, um, it's been um, an ongoing process with them. It was difficult at first. They rated our apps uh, NC-17 because we had female body cutaways. You know, they were anatomical, anatomically correct, and so they, uh, they, they deemed us an adult app, uh, which actually was good for sales. Um, <laughs> but, but now they understand what we're doing. I think they're, I think they're getting better at what they do at Apple. They, they are trying despite the fact that they still you know, ignore us and treat us like they don't matter. But I'm glad I answered your question. Go ahead. So, since we're on the line for a little bit, uh, is there an inherently greater liability or risk um, if you're developing a product that's going to be used by, let's say, physicians versus first responders or you know, this, uh, either having a participation for them or involves participation in some positions. So the question is, is there uh, any risk differential, if you will, depending on who your customer is, being physicians as one group or non-physicians as, as a different category? Um, it's, it's much riskier to build products for the non-physician because the level of training is much different. Um, an EMT, for example, Many of our EMTs are first-year EMTs. They buy our EMT app for basic life support because they're nervous about what they're having to go out and do. There's a lot to remember in our apps, help them to remember it. Um, we, we have a duty of care that I think is much higher there than if we were publishing medical reference information for a, you know, a certified professional who could actually argue with us about it. Many times we're serving people who don't, they're, they're vocational people who don't have the training. So um, I feel it's a higher duty of responsibility on our part. We do our best. So having spent a number of years defending medical malpractice cases, I'll <laughs> chime in on this one. Uh, risk, from your perspective, uh, can be managed in a number of ways. One is insurance. You, uh, you shift the risk to your insurance carrier if you can get it. Uh, another is the contractual agreement that you enter into with your customer, so your license and in that license agreement, of course, you will hire somebody to install reeds or Perkins Coie or somebody who will uh, write some great language that says, I know nothing and I'm not responsible for anything. <laughs> you use this at your own peril, you use it you know, at your own risk, and frankly, that's the way it has to be in this world, because it's, uh, you know, the U.S. is the most litigious place on the planet. But there are tools you can use to manage risk, and those are two good ones, insurance and what the agreement is you enter into with your customer. That's a way you can allocate risk outside of yourself. Sometimes it works, sometimes it won't, but better to have it than not. So is there a data format that's unified so all these different systems can communicate securely? Jeff, do you want to touch on that? So the question was, are there uh, uniform data standards, if you will, uh, in, in this world of mobile health? Well, I, I came out of data communication, telecommunications, and it's the worst I've ever seen. Across the board, there's a lot of standards used a lot of places, and they're getting better. Okay, because you know, healthcare for a long time was a piece of paper and a pad, you know, or a pad and pencil. And it's changing, and people are, are getting there, and it takes time. So it's going to take time. It, it, a lot of these changes are just going to take time. And they can't really make really quick changes because it affects so many people, just like the HR mandates that we're having. They're not the mandates if you don't want to lose money. Basically, you have to do it. It's take, they take time. So there's 400 systems out there. There's not a whole lot of, whole lot of uh, things that tell them how to do it, what's required, and what 
uh, types of standardization views, but we got 400 of them. That, yeah, that's, that's another point. Uh, you know, uh, devices, which, if you're buying terms and conditions, is probably the most important thing. If you look at my terms and conditions, it pretty much says what Microsoft says. We, we, we know nothing, we see nothing, we did nothing. Uh, and, and then you have to, and most of them, all of them out there do. Unfortunately, most of the liability falls on the back of the provider when it's a provider app. I, I need to add something to my last answer, by the way, in terms of managing risk. Make sure the quality of your information is excellent. Oh, yeah. Um, on that type of data that you do, it's very important. It's actually better if you can get the data from somebody else that really is in that field. Because you know, so you're, you're a developer or whatever, you don't want to be talking about you know, uh, congestive heart failure, you know, even though you may know it very well. Let somebody that really knows what they're doing, like Zinx or someone, do that data. Well, that's the source of truth. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sometime back, uh, I told Juan wrote about the cost of anger in the US, and um, particularly with the healthcare system. With the advent of this device, and this is you know, essentially the doctor in my pocket, right? um, has that compounded that effect? Um, has it changed that cost effect on our healthcare system? I can answer that now. Okay, sure. No. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that it won't. You know, we're just starting. Uh, I mean, how long's the I Store been around? You know, three years or something like that. You know, it's it takes change, and this some of the discussion that we're having is about change. Change management is the most difficult thing for anybody to deal with. You know, people do things a certain way, but there are things like take for instance congestive heart failure. You can get out of the bathtub, step on a scale made by within. $99, it'll upload your data up to Health Vault, run business analytics on the backside, and do a, a program, see if the weight's changing over time. If it gets above a certain threshold, send an email to the patient, send an email to the doctor, whatever the, the patient wants, and say, you need to get into the doctor, because the, that weight gain is because of water in your system, and you're going to have a failure. Uh, so something simple like that can save someone's life it's very inexpensive. After all the liability insurance, it goes up a lot. It, it, the healthcare system has, uh, it, it's still, in, in many ways, in the dark ages, technologically. I mean, you can't go look at your, for the most part, you can't go look at your electronic medical records on the right? um, A company called Healthion WebMD back in the day tried to solve that problem and found out what, uh, related to your question about data standards and uh, the fact is the healthcare system is very provincial. Uh, everything is invented here, and it's my way, and it's a proprietary way, and I'm not sharing. And it's, it's one of the many, many reasons why healthcare system costs are what they are and why they're growing so fast. Uh, so get in the middle, become an interoperability company. And, and there's a lot of people doing that. Uh, let me get some more. Go ahead. Yeah, it's curious, regarding the mobile apps making you healthier, I'm thinking of consumer-facing uh, mobile apps. It seems like they will, uh, they're, they're, they're people who are already motivated are using them, it would be healthier even without the mobile app because they're interested in becoming healthier. So how optimistic are you that they will be reaching people who may not be motivated? And can you give examples that are, uh, that, that are mobile apps that, that address people who aren't necessarily motivated to be healthier and it actually makes those people healthier? Well, maybe you can address that. How can you make mobile apps actually get people to change behavior? Yeah, so yeah, you have you have hit the nail on the head. People who are motivated uh, will, you know, take necessary actions to stay healthy. And I think, uh, like, we are, like Jeff just mentioned, it's about change. It's about when you see it working for someone else, it will probably motivate you to do it too. So that is the whole cycle that it's playing. It's like, you know, if my friend feels healthier by a certain diet, I'm more likely to adopt that same diet and try it. So it's like, but definitely, like the early adopters today for technology are all people who are, you know, uh, highly motivated. They know they are ready to, like, you know, go through all this, uh, you know, data mangling and you know, uh, up, update like your um, um, weight and blood pressure manually. But not everyone wants to do it, and that's why the adoption is still very low. But there aren't enough studies yet to say that you know the success rate is high, and we are hoping they will be. 
there have been like small studies like you know for AIDS or for maternal health or there's just very small studies but yeah I don't know. It, it has not reached the tipping point where everyone is using it yet. The thing that's really interesting is Africa has been very, very successful. That's why you know people take their phones and they give them to what is it, phones for health or something like that. And it's just SMS messaging, and it just helps people to remind them to take their medication. I think we've yet to really discover how how all kinds of healthcare technology, including mobile healthcare technology, can help influence behavior. I, I was in a restaurant the other night, and there was there were two women at at the table next door, and there, there's no other way to say it. They were very very large, and they had uh, appetizers, pretty much double entrees, and dessert. I don't know that a mobile app would have helped them not eat so much, and they really didn't need to. And obesity is one of the, you know, diabetes, obesity, uh, uh, medication non-compliance, those are three areas which have huge cost impacts on this country. And, uh, you know, obesity is one people can actually control. And I don't know if it's going to be mobile apps or drugs or, or what, but clearly, you know, the system today is not sustainable. Now, this is a room full of very smart, motivated people. And, um, in the healthcare space, there are lots of ways to play and lots of ways to leverage uh, your knowledge and your ability to create cool applications in ways that impact people's lives. And Chantal talked about that. And, um, you know, I think it's a wide open field and it's going to be for some time to come. So I think if you use your creativity, there's lots of research out there you can go look at um, on the areas which have the highest uh, cost components and where impacts can make the biggest difference. Um, and I uh, urge you to do that. Ely, I don't know if we want to stop now. Uh, it, it's right at 730. We can take more questions if you want to. If you want to take, uh, let's go another five minutes. And then... Great. Mark. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so, so, you guys can create value in the system. The idea of moving towards licensing the software engineer, uh, requiring licensure, professional licensure. Unless you had another engineer, it would just be big enough way that down some sort of mandates. Let's analysts, anybody see any uh, sort of specific software development requirements for healthcare apps? I haven't seen any. I don't, I don't unfortunately, I don't think so. Um, uh, because the cost. There, there's a lot of people, and I wrote some, I wrote a paper on this. Look at Bill Gates. He, he doesn't have a, a college degree, you know, he's divided out of high school, he's degree, so, you know, it, it's a difficult. It's, it's really difficult. Should there be? Maybe. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I just want to add one real quick thing. Think outside the United States also. you got a good idea. You can't get it through FDA. There's a lot of places out other than the United States. I know people in Bend who do it. They actually have a full company that does decided not to sell in the United States. I'll throw my two cents worth on this. If there were an, if there was an entity that were to certify programs, as having a certain uh, level of training and sensitivity for technical medical information, I would favor them and I would pay more for their services than I would for another type of program. We've, we've been very fortunate to work with people who have the ability, have the common sense to look at technical information outside of their domain and to be able to judge whether it was right or wrong on a high level. And they do catch some errors and, and they're always appreciated. But if there were such a body that would provide that kind of training, I would invest in that. I don't know that there will be but there yeah. certainly will be enough to manage. Oh, wait, just you had five minutes going to Madison. Uh, program, that's what we did. <laughs> there you go. So right, it's a good program. You can take one to one class. I'm telling you, these kids are really, really good. How about one more question? What are the biggest opportunities in mobile health space? Well, that's a wide open. Well, I, th I, I definitely think that in the future, a lot of people, health will be mobile. Everyone will have their health in their mobile phone. I think that time will come. 
Uh, it's just a matter of all you know standing on the weighing scale and that information being on my mobile phone or going to the you know getting a lab result and having that on my mobile phone. I, I don't think that's very far away. That is definitely going to come, and once when, once that comes, probably we're really going to see a transformation in the whole healthcare system. Well, I used to write that uh, a smartphone will be our remote control to healthcare. The reason is uh, there's a company down in Southern Cal that actually has a embeddable uh, uh, constant glucose monitoring uh, system that they said within a year it'll be able to talk to your smartphone. So, you know, just think about the sensors and the monitors. They already have band-aids that you can put on that can take care of your heart to watch your heart. The best thing, you know, this little phone has more uh, power than my laptop of five years ago. So it just makes sense. <laughs> I would say the big opportunity in the next five years is bandwidth, uh, network, as well as Wi Fi. To the extent that you know, the uh, billions of smart devices we have out there can connect faster and send larger files, more information, um, more timely to each other, in our case, from the field to an EOC immediately, we're seeing all kinds of economic opportunity in that. Um, so we're waiting for them to catch up with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, how about a round of applause for this? Thank you all for coming.